the trail winds round the bank of the fork and comes out on the left side of the stage road about a thousand feet below it. That's the valley and hollow where Harry lives, and that's the only way it can be found. For all along the left of the stage road is a sheer pitch down that thousand feet, where no one can get up or down. I understand, said Bryce, with sparkling eyes. I'll find my way all right. And when ye get thar, look out for yourself, put in the woman earnestly. Ye may have regular greenhorn's luck and pick up flow afore ye cross the boundary, for she's that bold that when she gets lonesome o' stay and there she goes wanderin' out o' bounds. The young man smiled, and again showed his empty belt. None, he said truthfully. I ain't sure if that ain't the safest thing arter all with a shot like Harry, remarked the old man grimly. Well, so long, he added and turned away. It was clearly a leave-taking, and Bryce, warmly thanking them both, returned to the road. It was not far to the scene of the obstruction, yet but for Tarbox's timely hint, the little trail up the mountain side would have escaped his observation. Ascending, he soon found himself creeping along a narrow ledge of rock, hidden from the road that ran fifty yards below by a thick network growth of thorn and bramble, which, perilous in the extreme to any hesitating foot, at one point, directly above the obstruction, the ledge itself was missing broken away by the fall of the tree from the forest crest higher. For an instant Bryce stood dizzy and irresolute before the gap, looking down for a foothold. His eye caught the faint imprint of a woman's shoe on a clay rock projecting midway of the chasm. It must have been the young girl's footprint made that morning, for the narrow toe was pointed in the direction she would go, where she could pass should he shrink from going. Without further hesitation, he, from time to time, as he went on along the difficult track, the narrow little toe print pointed the way to him, like in a row through the wilds. It was a pleasant thought, and yet a perplexing one. Would he have undertaken this quest just to see her? Would he be content with that if his other motive failed? For as he made his way up to the ridge he was more than once assailed by doubts of the practical success of In the excitement of last night, and even the hopefulness of the early morning, it seemed an easy thing to persuade the vain and eccentric highwaymen that their interests might be identical. The risks that he was running seemed to his youthful fancy to atone for any defects in his logic or his plans. Yet as he crossed the ridge, leaving the civilized highway behind him, and descended the narrow trail, which grew wilder at each step, his arguments seemed no longer so He now hurried forward, however, with a feverish haste to anticipate the worst that might befall him. The trail grew more intricate in the deep ferns. The friendly little footprint had vanished in this primeval wilderness. As he pushed through the gorge, he could hear at last the roar of the North Fork forcing its way through the canyon that crossed the gorge at right angles. At last he reached its current, shut in by two narrow precipitous walls that were spanned five hundred feet above by the stage road over a perilous bridge. As he approached the gloomy canyon, he remembered that the river, seen from above, seemed to have no banks, but to have cut its way through the solid rock. He found, however, a faint ledge made by caught driftwood from the current and the debris of the overhanging cliffs. Again the narrow footprint on the ooze was his guide. At last, emerging from the canyon, a strange view burst upon his sight. The river turned abruptly to the right, and following the mountain side, left a small hollow completely walled in by the surrounding heights. To his left was the ridge he had descended from on the other side, and he now understood the singular detour he had made. He was on the other side of the stage road also, which ran along the mountain shelf a thousand feet above him. The wall, a sheer cliff, made the hollow inaccessible from that side. Little hills covered with bucky encompassed it. It looked like a sylvan retreat and yet was as secure in its isolation and approaches as the outlaw's den that it was. He was gazing at the singular prospect when a shot rang in the air. It seemed to come from a distance, and he interpreted it as a signal. 
but it was followed presently by another. And putting his hand to his hat to keep it from falling, he found that the upturned brim had been pierced by a bullet. He stopped at this evident hint, and, taking his dispatch bag from his shoulder, placed it significantly upon a boulder, and looked around as if to await the appearance of the unseen. The rifle shot rang out again, the bag quivered, and turned over with a bullet hole through it, he took out his white handkerchief and waved it. Another shot followed, and the handkerchief was snapped from his fingers, torn from corner to corner. A feeling of desperation and fury seized him. He was being played with by a masked and skillful assassin, who only waited until it pleased him to fire the deadly shot, but this time he set his white lips together, but with a determined face and unfaltering step walked directly towards it. In another moment he believed and almost hoped that all would be over. With such a marksman he would not be maimed, but killed outright. He had not covered half the distance before a man lounged out from behind the tree carelessly shouldering his rifle. He was tall but slightly built, with an amused, critical manner, and nothing about him to suggest the bloodthirsty assassin. He met Bryce halfway, dropping his rifle slantingly across his breast with his hands lightly grasping the lock, and gazed at the young man curiously. You look as if you'd had a big scare, old man, but you've clear grit for all that, he said, with a critical and reassuring smile. Now, what are you doing here? Stay. He continued, as Bryce's parched lips prevented him from replying immediately. I ought to know your face. Hello, you were the expressman. His glance suddenly shifted, and swept past Bryce over the ground beyond him to the entrance of the hollow, but his smile returned as he apparently sat as Well, what do you want? I want to see Snapshot Harry, said Bryce, with an effort. His voice came back more slowly than his color, but that was perhaps hurried by a sense of shame at his physical weakness. What you want is a drop of whiskey, said the stranger good-humouredly, taking his arm, and we'll find it in that shanty just behind the tree. To Bryce's surprise, a few, a few flowers were in boxes on the window signs, as Bryce fancied, of feminine taste. When they reached the threshold, somewhat of this quality was also visible in the interior. When Bryce had partaken of the whiskey, the stranger, who had kept silence, pointed to a chair and said smilingly, I am Henry Dimwood, alias Snapshot Harry, and th I mean, of course, he stopped and hesitated, the actual robbery before you stopped us. What, said Harry, springing to his feet, do you mean to say you knew it, right? Yes, he said, I knew it when I handed down the box. I saw that the lock had been forced, but I snapped it together again. It was my fault. Perhaps I should have warned you, but I am solely to blame. Did you, Bill, know of it? asked the highwayman with singular excitement. Not at the time. I give you my word, replied Bryce quickly, thinking only of loyalty to his old comrade. I never told him till we reached the station. And he knew it then, repeated Harry eagerly. Yes. Did he say anything? Did he do anything? Did he look astonished? Bryce remembered Bill's uncontrollable merriment, but replied vaguely and diplomatically. Then, whipping his up, he said in a shaky voice, It would have been sure death. The zoo have trusted myself near that station, but I think I'd have risked it just afterwards, my young friend, like you, Bill, afterwards. He stopped. His whole expression changed. It was done by two sneaking hounds, he said sharply. One whom I suspected before, and one, a new hand, a pal of his. They were detached to watch the coach and be satisfied that the greenbacks were aboard, for it isn't my style to hold up except for something special. They were to take seats on the coach as far as Ringwood Station three miles below where we held you up, and to get out there and pass the word to us that it was all right. They didn't. That made us a little extra careful, seeing something was wrong but never suspecting them. We found out afterwards that they got one of my scouts to cut down that tree, 
saying it was my orders and a part of our game, calculating in the stoppage and confusion to collar the swag. Without knowing it, you played into their hands by going into Tarbox's cabin. But how did you know this? Interrupted Bryce, in wonder. They forgot one thing, continued Snapshot Harry grimly. They forgot that half an hour before and half an hour after a stage is stopped, we have that road patrolled every foot of it. While I was opening the box in the brush, the two fools, sneaking along the road, came slap upon one of my patrols and then tried to run for it. One was dropped, but before he was plugged full of holes and hung up on a tree, he confessed and said the other man who escaped had the greenbacks. Bryce's face fell. Then they are lost, he said bitterly. Not unless he eats them, as he may want to do before I'm done on him, for he must either starve or come out. That road is still watched by my men from Tarbox cabin to the bridge. He's there somewhere, and can't get forward or backward. Look, he said, rising and going to the door. That road, he pointed to the stage road, a narrow ledge flanked on one side by a precipitous mountain wall, and on the other by an equally precipitate descent, is his limit. And from the time you entered it until you reached the bottom, you were signaled here from point to point. He would have been dropped. I merely gave you a hint of what might have happened to you if you were up to any little... Come now, what is your business? Thus challenged, Rice plunged with youthful hopefulness into his plan. If, as he voiced it, it seemed to him a little extreme, he suggested that they should work together to recover the money. That the express company should know that the unprecedented stealthy introduction of robbers in the guise of passengers was not snapshot Harry's method. The highwayman listened with a tolerant smile, but, to Bryce's surprise, this appeal to his vanity touched him less than the prospective punishment of the thief. It would serve the d-town right, he muttered. Instead of being shot like a man, he was made to do time in prison, like the ordinary sneak thief that he is when every man in my gang is a shareholder in these greenbacks, for I work on the square. And it's for him to say whether he'll give them up for a reward and the good opinion of the express company. Perhaps, he went on, with a peculiar smile, it's just as well that you tried it on me first, however. I'll sound the boys, and see what comes of it but not until you re snapshot Harry smiled again. Well, if you come across the D, thief, and you recognize him and can get the greenbacks from him, I'll pass over the game to you. He rose and added, apparently her own color was a little heightened as she slipped into the room, but the two managed to look demurely at each other without a word of recognition. This is my niece, Flora, said snapshot Harry, with a slight wave of the hand that was by no means uncourtly, and her company will keep you from any impertinent questioning as well as if this is Mr. Bryce Flo, who came to see me on business, and has quite forgotten my practical joking. The girl acknowledged Bryce's bow with a shyness very different from her manner. Bryce felt embarrassed and evidently showed it for his host, with a smile, put an end to the constraint by shaking the young man's hand heartily, bidding him good-bye, and accompanying him. Once on their way, Mr. Bryce's spirits returned. I told you last night, he said, that I hoped to meet you the next time with a better introduction. You suggested your uncle's. Well, are you satisfied? But you didn't come to see me, said the girl mischievously. How do you know what my intentions were? returned the young man gaily, gazing at the girl's charming face with a serious doubt as to the singleness of his own intentions. Oh, because I know, she answered, with a toss of her brown head. I heard what you said to Uncle Harry. Mr. Bryce's brow contracted. Perhaps you saw me too when I came, he said, with a slight touch of bitterness as he thought of his reception. Miss Flo laughed. Bryce walked on silently. The girl was heartless and worthy of her education. After a pause, she said demurely, I knew he wouldn't hurt you, but you didn't. That's where you showed your grit in walking straight on, and I suppose you were greatly amused, 
he replied scornfully. The girl lifted her arms a little warily, as with a half-sigh she readjusted her brown braids under her uncle's grey slouch hat, which she had caught up as she passed out. There ain't much to laugh at here, she said, but it was mighty funny when you tried to put your head straight, and then found there was that bullet hole right through the brim, and the way you stared at it, Lordy, her musical laugh was infectious, and swept. He laughed, too. At last, she said, gazing at his hat, it won't do for you to go back to your folks wearin' that sort of thing. Here, take mine. With a saucy movement she audaciously lifted his hat from his head and placed her own upon it. But this is your uncle's hat, he remonstrated. All the same. He spoiled yours, she laughed, adjusting his hat upon her own head. But I'll keep yours to remember you by. I'll loop it up by this hole and it'll look mighty purty. Jess see. She plucked a wild rose from a bush by the wayside, and passing the stalk through the bullet hole, pinned the brim against the crown by a thorn. There, she said, putting on the hat again with a little affectation of coquetry, how's that? Mr. Bryce thought it very picturesque, and becoming to the graceful head and laughing eyes beneath it, and said so. Then, becoming in his turn audacious, he drew nearer to her side. I suppose you know the forfeit of putting on a gentleman's hat. Apparently she did, for she suddenly made a warning gesture, and said not here. It would be a bigger forfeit than you'd hear. He followed quickly. I didn't mean that, she said. But in the meantime he had kissed the pink tip of her ear under its brown coils. He was, nevertheless, somewhat discomfited by her undisturbed manner and serene face. You don't seem to mind being shot at, she said, with an odd smile, but it won't do for you to calculate that everybody shoots as carefully as Uncle Harry. I don't understand, he replied. Ye ain't very complimentary, or you'd allow that other folks might be wanting what you took just now, and might consider you was poaching. She returned gravely. My best and strongest halt among those men is that Uncle Harry would kill the first one who tried anything like that on, and they know it. That's how I get all the liberty I want here, and can come and go alone as I like. Bryce's face flushed quickly with genuine shame and remorse. Do forgive me, he said hurriedly. I didn't think. I'm a brute and a fool. Uncle Harry allowed you was either drunk or a born idiot when you was promenading into the valley just now, she said with a smile. And what did you think? He asked a little uneasily. I thought you didn't look like a drinking man, she answered audaciously. Bryce bit his lip and walked on silently, at which she cast a sidelong glance under her widely spaced heavy lashes and said demurely, I thought last night it was mighty good for you to stand up not in the style o' that land grabber Heckschel, nor that peart newspaper man, neither. Of course I gave them as good as they sent. She went on, with a little laugh, but Bryce could see that her sensitive lip in profile had the tremulous and resentful curve of one who was accustomed. Was it possible that this reckless, self-contained girl felt her position keenly? I am proud to have your good opinion, he said, with a certain respect mingled with his admiring glance, when you opened out about them greenbacks, I just clutched my cheer so. She illustrated her words with a gesture of her hands, and her face actually seemed to grow pale at the recollection. But it was lucky none o' oh, the gang heard ye or suspected anything. I reckon that's why he sent me with you, to keep them from dogging you and asking questions that a straight man like you would be sure to answer. But they daren't come nigh ye as long as I'm with you. She threw back her head and rose crested hat with a mock air of protection that, however, had a certain real pride in it. I am very glad of that, if it gives me the chance of having your company alone, returned Bryce, smiling and very grateful to your uncle, whatever were his reasons for making it. But you have already been that to me, and he told her of the footprints. But for you, he added, with gentle significance, I should not have been here. She was silent for a moment, and he could only see the back of her head and its heavy brown coil. After a pause, she asked abruptly, Where's your handkerchief? He took it from his pocket. 
Her ingenious uncle's bullet had torn rather than pierced the cambric. I thought so, she said, gravely examining it, but I can mend it as good as new. I reckon you allow I can't sue, she continued, but I do heaps of mendin. As the digger squaw and Chinamen we have here do only the coarser work. I'll send it back to you, and meanwhiles you keep mine. She drew a handkerchief from her pocket and handed it to him. To his great surprise it was a delicate one, beautifully embroidered and utterly incongruous to her station. The idea that flashed upon him, it is to be feared, showed itself momentarily in his hesitation and embarrassment. She gave a quick laugh. Don't be frightened. It's bought and paid for. Uncle Harry don't touch passengers fixins. That ain't his style. You oughter know that. Yet, in spite of her laugh, he could see the sensitive pout of her lower lip. I was only thinking, he said hurriedly and sympathetically, that it was too fine for me. But I will be proud to keep it as a souvenir of you. It's not too pretty for that. Uncle gets me these things. He don't care what they cost, she went on, ignoring the compliment. Why, I've got awfully fine gowns up there that I only wear when I go to Marisville once it in a while. Does he take you there? asked Bryce. No, she answered quietly. Not a little defiantly that he's afeard, for they can't prove anything against him. No man can swear to him, and there ain't an officer that cares to go for him. But he's that shy for me he don't care to have me mixed with him. But nobody recognizes you sometimes, but I don't care for that. She cocked her hat a little audaciously, but Bryce noticed that her Whenever I go into shops, it's always yes, miss, and no, miss, and certainly Miss Dimwood. Oh, they were mighty respectful. I reckon they allow that snapshot Harry's rifle carries far. Presently she faced him again, for their conversation had been carried on in profile. There was a critical, searching look in her brown eyes. Here I'm talking to you as if you were one, Mr. Bryce was positive she was going to say one of the gang, but she hesitated and concluded, one of my relations like cousin Hiram. I wish you would think of me as being as true a friend. She did not reply immediately, but seemed to be examining the distance. They were not far from the canyon now, and the river bank. A fringe of buckies hid the base of the mountain, which had begun to tower up above them to the invisible stage road overhead. I am going to be a real guide to you now, she said suddenly. When we reach that bucky corner and are out of sight, we will turn into it instead of going through the canyon. You shall go up the mountain to the stage road from this side, but it is impossible, he exclaimed in astonishment. Your uncle said so. Coming down but not going up, she returned with a laugh. I found it, and no one knows it but myself. He glanced up at the towering cliff. Its nearly perpendicular flanks were seamed with fissures, some clefts deeply set with st I will show you, she said, answering his look with a smile of triumph. I haven't tramped over this whole valley for nothing, but wait until we reach the river bank. They must think that we've gone through the canyon. They guess anyone who is watching us, said the girl dryly. A few steps further on brought them to the bucky thicket, which extended to the river bank and mouth of the canyon. The girl lingered for a moment ostentatiously before it, and then, saying come, suddenly turned at right angles into the thicket. Bryce followed, and the next moment they were hidden by its friendly screen from the valley. On the other side rose the mountain wall, leaving a narrow trail before them. It was composed of the rocky debris and fallen trees of the cliff, from which buckies and larches were now springing. It was uneven, irregular, and slowly ascending. But the young girl led the way with the free footstep of a mountaineer, and yet a grace that was akin to delicacy. Nor could he fail to notice that, after the western girl's fashion, she was shod more elegantly and lightly than was consistent with the rude and rustic surroundings. It was the same slim shoe print which had guided him that morning. Presently she stopped, and seemed to be gazing curiously at the cliff's side. Bryce followed the direction of her eyes. 
On a protruding bush at the edge of one of the wooded clefts of the mountain flank something was hanging, and in the freshening southerly wind was flapping heavily, like a raven's wing, or as if still sat. That's mighty queer, said Flo, gazing intently at the unsightly and incongruous attachment to the shrub, which had a vague, weird suggestion. It wasn't there yesterday. It looks like a man's coat, remarked Bryce uneasily. Woo, said the girl. Then somebody has come down who won't go up again. There's a lot of fresh rocks and brush here, too. What's that? She was pointing to a spot some yards before them where there had been a recent precipitation of debris and uprooted shrubs. But mingled with it lay a mass of rags strangely akin to the tattered remnant that flagged from the bush a hundred feet above them. The girl suddenly uttered a sharp feminine cry of mingled horror and disgust, the first weakness of sex she had shown, and, recoiling, grasped Bryce's arm. Don't go there, come away. But Bryce had already seen that which, while it shocked him, was urging him forward with an invincible fascination. Gently releasing himself and bidding the girl stand back, he moved toward the unsightly heap. Gradually it disclosed a grotesque caricature of a human figure, but so maimed and doubled up that it seemed a stuffed and fallen scarecrow. As is common in men stricken suddenly down by accident in the fullness of life, the clothes asserted themselves before all else with a hideous ludicrousness, obliterating even the majesty of death. The garments seemed to have never fitted the wearer, but to have been assumed in ghastly jocularity, a boot half off the swollen foot, a ripped waistcoat thrown over the shoulder. At first the body appeared to be headless, but as Bryce cleared away the debris and lifted it, he saw with horror that the head was twisted under the shoulder, and swung helplessly from the dislocated. But that horror gave way to a more intense and thrilling emotion as he saw the face, although strangely free from laceration or disfigurement, and empurpled and distended into the simulation of a strange and selfish resentment took possession of him. Here was the man through whom he had suffered shame and peril, and who even now seemed complacently victorious in death. He examined him closely. His coat and waistcoat had been partly torn away in his fall. His shirt still clung to him, but through its torn front could be seen a heavy tread. Forgetting his disgust, Bryce tore away the shirt and unloosed the belt. It was saturated with water like the rest of the clothing, but its pocket seemed heavy and distended. In another instant he had opened it and discovered the envelope containing the packet of greenbacks its seal still inviolate and unbroken. It was the stolen treasure. A faint sigh recalled him to himself. The girl was standing a few feet from him, regarding him curiously. It's the thief himself, he said, in a briefless explanation. In trying to escape he must have fallen from the road above. But here are the greenbacks safe. We must go back to your uncle at once, he said excitedly. Come, are you mad? She cried in astonishment. No, returned Bryce in equal astonishment, but you know I agreed with him that we should work together to recover the money, and I must show him our good luck. He told you this man's death is the result of his attempting to escape from your uncle's guards along the road. The merit of it belongs to them and your uncle. It would be cowardly and mean of me to take advantage of it. The girl looked at him with an expression of mingled admiration and pity. But the guards were placed there before he ever saw you, said she impatiently. And whatever Uncle Harry may want to do, he must do what the gang says. And with the money once in their possession, or even in yours if they knew it, I wouldn't give much for its chances, or yours either for getting out of this hollow again. But if they are treacherous, You've no right to say they were treacherous when they knew nothing of your plans, said the girl sharply. Your company would have more called to say you were treacherous to it for making a plan without consulting them, Bryce winced, for he had never thought of that before. You can offer that reward after you get away from here with the greenbacks. But, she added proudly with a toss of her head, go back if you want to tell him all, tell him where you found it, tell him I did not take you through the canyon but was showing you a new tr Forgive me. 
he said hurriedly. You are right, and I am wrong again. I will do just what you say. I will first place these greenbacks in a secure place, and then get away first. That's your only halt, she interrupted him quickly, her eyes still flashing through indignity. Come quick, for I must put you on the trail before they miss me. She darted forward. He followed, but she kept the lead, as much he fancied, to evade his observation as to...